12. Uh, be prayerful, if you would, uh, circumstance with the nursery, with the uh, with Sunday school, how we're going to uh, kind of pull these things in here. Uh, it may be a little bit early yet to, uh, to stretch out that far, but uh, we certainly need to be considering that uh, with the idea of moving on towards uh, that. I know we've got a couple of folks and uh, the reason they don't come is just that with no nursery, they'd be completely preoccupied with uh, uh, chasing little ones and you can say, well, bring them. Yeah, it's easy to say if you're not chasing them. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, just, just keep those as matters of prayer. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 12. Moving right along here. These are the statutes and judgments which uh, you shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess it all the days that ye shall li that ye live upon the earth. These, these statutes that we read about, uh, as you read through the Old Testament, the one thing that will help you to understand these things is rightly dividing. How many people ever heard of the Salem witch trials? You know what that came from? The Bible says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Uh, they didn't realize that was in the, an Old Testament in the land of Israel, not in another land, not in another circumstance. They were not to kill people. They were to be merciful to the lost. They were to reach, to hold forth the words of life, not the words of death. There are things that capital punishment was to be ex extended for, but it certainly was not that. The idea of uh, rightly dividing and a failure to do that has caused almost every heresy, every uh, fracture, and every uh, cultish uh, kind of... Uh, uh, interpretation you can imagine in the church. So God gives them these things to celebrate in the land. The reason they're in the land is because as we read here shortly, he's going to single out one place where they're supposed to meet. And you can't meet that one place everywhere else if that one place isn't there. So it's in Israel, it's in Jerusalem. That's where God ultimately uh, rested with his uh, place where he was to meet with the people. And we'll talk about that uh, kind of as we go along here. So all the days of their life. Now, the, the fact that that says that, today you see people still, you got to obey the law. You got to do, well, you don't put God first. Guess what? Not going to be well with you. You don't honor your mother and father. Not going to be well with you. But if you think you're going to heaven because you're uh, honoring mother and father, that ain't going to work. God's not first if you're putting mom and dad above God. And all I'm saying in all these things is as we read through Deuteronomy, what we're trying to illustrate here and trying to glean and gather is that when God told them these things, they were for a specific place. They were for specific times and reasons. As we understand those times and reasons, it will help us understand better how are we then to live? What, what uh, understanding might we gain by knowing why God said for them to do those things? And what is it that carries through the New Testament that was begun in the old or was uh, the foundational principles that were laid down there that need to be continued? And which ones need to be left in Israel, left planted and rooted to the ground and not brought everywhere else as not uh, amiable to the gospel, if you will. We read, uh, I believe it was uh, last Sunday, about uh, the Bible says uh, pertaining to the gospel that the Jews are the enemy of the gospel, but they're beloved for the Father's sake. So you, you cannot mingle these two things together. God has them separate for a difference. So again, we'll uh, see what the Lord will give us here. And it's the uh, continuation of blessings and cursings. Everything that Israel did was going to add to their blessings or uh, begin to enumerate their, the curse that God was going to put on the land. Their obedience, uh, and this is a lesson we can certainly glean, their obedience to God's revelation to them individually as a nation gave them their blessings. The fact that they were who they were and God called them out gave them their national status. So God calls the Christian out individually. That gives them their standing. Uh, and then uh, how they conduct themselves under those directions God gives a Christian becomes their state. They're not going to lose their standing 
but they can lose that state. That state can be bad. <laughs> it can lose rewards in that. All right, let's, let me get on here before I get you even more confused. Uh, verse 2. They come into this land. This land is filled with people. That land had been developed, worked on, farms built, cities built. And God says ye, in verse 2, Ye shall utterly destroy all the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods, upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. That's where those groves came in in uh, Ahab and uh, Ahab's day and Elijah's day. They'd landscape a little piece of land out there and put an idol under it and go out there and sacrifice and carry on. They were to be utterly destroyed. And ye shall overthrow their altars, break their pillars, burn their groves with fire. Ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the names of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Uh, you, uh, you shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt uh, thou uh, thither thou shalt come. All right, so. All the days Israel was there, they were to be under this law. When they come back in the millennium, some of these laws are altered. The sacrificial laws have a, a bit of variation in them. You read in uh, Ezekiel, and there are variations to these things, the, the general things there. But they become now, uh, as the Lord's Supper is to us, a memorial to what the Lord's done. Those sacrifices they offer seem to carry along the same kind of thing. It's the reminder of what the great God of, of uh, Israel had done in order to gain their salvation, win that land for them, and bring them into the, the place of their inheritance. So this land that has been given them, uh, being overrun with heathen, God says, utterly destroy what's there. And uh, what he says specifically is places. Now today we look at it, well, you can, I mean, you know, you can't destroy somebody else's religion. You can't destroy the whole, you know, do you ever think about this? In, in World War II, the Vatican was being used to, to subvert almost everything because it was under Mussolini and they'd made a, a concordat or an agreement with uh, Nazi Germany. They were uh, just duplicitous at every level of life. Uh, trading in the souls of men for their benefits that they got by being on the wrong, on the Nazi side during the war, and uh, the Vatican never got bombed. Catholic churches, by and large, if they were bombed, it was by accident. It wasn't on purpose. You say, well, why is that? They were protecting them. Well, that's just another religion. You can't do that. A lot of our people are Catholic. God says, I don't want anybody else to have this polytheism. I don't want anybody to have this multicultural aspect. Those people are not going to live under the laws I'm specifically giving to you. I want you to have that. You look at the New Testament. That Bible says uh, over in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, I, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. Don't join in with the heathen in that. Don't accommodate their religion by watering down yours, by softening your testimony, by eliminating the fact that in Christ alone is salvation. Uh, you want to get along with the world. I got to just talk about God. You want to make a, a schism there that'll fracture the world pole to pole? Put Jesus in the middle of it all. They don't want him. They, they'll talk about God till their hair falls out, but not Jesus. So we've got to be mindful of all of those things, that we do all these things to be acceptable to God and please the Lord. So they're to uh, take down their places. Uh, and it all dealt with property of these things. And I've had people over the years say, well, that, the God of the Old Testament, he was mean. He, he just don't go in there and kill all those people, women and children and men, and, and even kill the animals in some cases and burn their property and all but they never seem to uh, grasp the concept of why did God tell them that? These people that had 400 years, 
that Israel was down in Egypt to repent of their sin. Uh, the fact that they heard all about Israel coming back out of the wilderness. They'd heard about Israel right along there. They knew all those things. What God said to the prophets wasn't, wasn't singularly through Israel. It was spread all over the place by the prophets. Uh, what, uh, what those people knew was everything that God said they needed to know to repent, but they didn't. And when they rejected repentance, kind of like New Testament people in the New Testament era, I'll put it that way, all that's left for them is the judgment of God to fall on their heads. They might be nice people. They might be friendly folks. They might use good grammar and a right fork at dinner time. But God says, I'm not interested with their culture. I'm not interested with their manners. What I'm interested in, are they putting me first? Are they doing what my book says that is required of them in order for judgment to bypass them? Just as the blood was necessary in, uh, in Egypt over the doorpost, the blood of Jesus Christ is necessary today for every whosoever in the world that the judgment of God has the ability to bypass them and not bring them into judgment. Their altar, very altars, the holiest things they had were to be pulled down. The pillars they had erected in memorial and uh, uh, observation of uh, days and, and holidays and events and things were to be destroyed. God says, I don't want a vestige of this paganism left for my people to be influenced by. And you look at, how many of you have ever seen Rembrandt painting? They call it Renaissance art. They're all half naked and they're Rubenesque and the, you know, the, the near or, or total nudity. And uh, Bob Jones University, uh, since uh, when Bob Jones died, Junior was a, was a big art student aficionado. So he started collecting all of this uh, pornographic uh, stuff and puts a museum in Bob Jones University. You think, well, what do you think? It's art. Do you see how you, you subvert the holiness of God? you see how you subvert all of it? You take something that is done by unholy Roman Catholic uh, mackerel snappers, they used to be called. <laughs> all kinds, all kinds of uh, uh, descriptive names. And it's brought right into the, uh, what was be considered by some, as certainly not any Bible believer, but by some as an, uh, an ortho orthodox bastion of curi uh, Christianity. No, it's a compromised educational system run by people who are so involved in the world that they've lost sight of what truth is. Uh, they were also supposed to uh, burn up their groves. If you've ever read the story of Gideon, you remember Gideon came in at night. It was terrified of what the people there were going to do, came in at night, cut down the groves of, uh, of the pagans that were there. And when they get up the next day, uh, man, here's I just got a, a, a big pile of wood chips out there. Yeah, who did that and what happened? They go to Gideon's father, probably had a real good idea who did it. Maybe, you know, it's, people know what you think. And he said, let Baal plead for himself. If your God's stuff is all messed up, why don't your God take care of it? Simple, your God doesn't amount to anything. Your God's a bunch of tree stumps. We need to look at these things in a biblical kind of fashion. We don't have to be mean. We don't have to be cruel. We don't have to be harsh. But what we have to do, uh, have to be as honest, straightforward, and direct with the gospel presentation. Anything that was identified with the religion of these people was to be put away, extinguished, and uh, totally destroyed so that it would never appear to the eyes. I believe it's Numbers uh, 35 where it says, if you don't destroy all the pleasant pictures of the land, they'll be pricks to your eyes. In other words, these things are going to keep poking at you. Every time you see them, you're going to, well, you know, they weren't so bad. I mean, they're just regular people. They just had a different way of looking at things. You can excuse away all that stuff if you want, and I've seen people do it. Well, you know, there, there are some saved people in the Catholic Church. Maybe there are. There are probably some saved people in Jehovah Witnesses. That doesn't mean you have to tolerate the Jehovah Witnesses' false doctrine. That doesn't mean you go along and encourage that, the heretical part of any of that stuff. If we're to be people that God uses with a ministry of reconciliation, it isn't us that needs to be reconciled to heathen religions. 
It's the people of the heathen religions that need to be reconciled to God. That is our mercy to bring that, that, uh, those words, the ministry of reconciliation to them. They can't bring along the old things of the land of Canaan with them. It has to be new as God directs. So anything that uh, the images, the idols, and the names, I think we mentioned this the other night, Luke 16, uh, verse 15 to 31. You don't need to turn there, but it's the story of the, the, uh, the rich man and Lazarus. And Lazarus is that old guy who's laying under the guy's porch, and he's just waiting for some crumbs to fall off of the dog bowl that is eating up, uh, the dog's eating out of up there. And the rich man, he goes about his business, and the rich man talks about how good he is, and the rich man has people over for company, and the rich man eats really well, and the rich man dies, and he goes to hell. You know, it's the interesting thing about that rich man, he never has a name. God's not interested in the names of the lost. Your names, if you're saved, are written in the book of life. That lamb's got you engraved on the palms of his hand. That lamb has put your name in probably an indelibly written in his precious blood in that book of life in heaven, never to be blotted out. But the lost, they're gone. God says, there's no point in remembering them. There's nothing worth remembering about them. They say, well, that's awful. Uh, let me just remind you, anybody like the idea in, uh, in Revelation uh, 21 where it says, God shall wipe away every tear? If you could think about your family burning in hell forever, and you'd have a much better picture of it from heaven than you would sitting in those seats right now, wouldn't you? I mean, there's nothing to be hidden from you then. You think you could sit, Peter, oh, praise the Lord. Their names are gone. All those previous things, all those things before they, God's got to purge them out of the, out of the memory. That's, that's mercy. God says, I'm not going to let you lament those lost people all, all uh, the days of their life or all, all your life. So at any rate, Israel was, uh, the names of the wicked were to be blotted out. The names of those religious things were to be blotted out. A lot of uh, religious leaders, they have these... Uh, uh, exorcism ministries. I'll, I'll put all that in quotes. Uh, they have all kinds of things. And uh, they're going around when they throw in ca casting devils out there. And what's your name? And uh, what's your social security number? And you got any credit cards on you? They're, they're trying to get all this information from these devils. Why would anybody want to know that? Is that going to help you? God's not interested in their name. People make up names. People seek other devils to call them by name. They want a familiarity with them. God says, I don't want a familiarity with anything that isn't mine. You know, when we witness to people, when we pray for people, we need to be reminded of that. God says, I'm interested in the saved. If they want to get saved, I will make them mine. They will be a peculiar treasure to me. But if they don't, no skin off of my nose. You think about uh, somebody mentioned the other day, God, God's up in heaven probably crying over all these lost people. No, he's not. Jesus wept over Jerusalem because of who they were and their rejection of him, knowing what was coming for the little ones that were, that were there. And I don't think Lord has that. He has enough mercy and enough sympathy and enough empathy towards us to provide a Savior. But if you don't grab onto that Savior and, and make him yours... Anybody know what L-O-V-E is compared to L-O-V-E-D? Love as opposed to loved? Isn't one present, one's past tense? So look at it this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in them should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, if you simply turn that thing around, if you don't love the Savior God sent, You've just eliminated yourself from the love of God. It isn't that God didn't love you. It's that your, your refusal to love him has put you out of the running to be on God's side. All right, I, I, I think everybody probably got a, a pretty good idea of all those things there. Anyway, um, in verse uh, 4, "...ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God." No idols, 
none of those things. Say, how do you know that? Well, because God's going to tell them in the next verse where, how, when, and so forth that God wants to meet them. In verse 5, but unto the place. You know what, the, what they were problem was? They thought, well, we can meet God in nature. Anybody ever witnessed to somebody? Well, I just go out in nature. You know, I got to the beach, or I got to the mountains, or I got to the racetrack, or I go to... <laughs> Yeah, everybody thinks they're going to do that. You know what the Bible says? God says, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now listen, I'm not saying you can't worship God in any place. What I'm saying this is God proscribes the particular manner by which you will be able to worship him and he will receive it from you. It isn't just because God's not taking anything somebody wants to throw out. God says, uh, that music, that stuff you call music around the golden calf, to a spiritual man, that sounds like war. Sounds like them that are being overcome. It sounds like a whole bunch of things, but it doesn't sound like worship to God. Say, well, who gets to decide? God does, but he's called it psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody unto the Lord in your heart. Most modern music doesn't have a melody to it. It just has a driving beat. And that's why people like it. it. It pulsates with the same bodily rhythm. Okay, but unto the place, verse 5, which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither shalt thou come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hands unto ye and all your household wherein the Lord your God, uh, thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man wherein is right in his own eyes. Well, God says, uh, up till this time, you've been permitted to pretty much do what you want. But as you get into that land, everything becomes more specific. Why? Because God can ascribe finally a place that is clean, a place that is a place of his own choosing, a group of people that are singularly uh, elect to be his, his priest and his ministers. So Israel was never to be like the heathen. God's going to give them a place. God's going to give them a manner. God's going to give them a way in which he wants to be honored, remembered, worshiped, served, satisfied with offerings and all of these things. And don't try and moderate those things with the way the heathen do it, or God will not accept it. But unto the place. They had been in the wilderness for 40 years. They're getting ready to, to march across the river into the land. They had built the tabernacle the, the end of, about the end of the first year they were out there. Uh, at the end of uh, Exodus 40, that tabernacle, all the various parts and pots and pans and uh, instruments are brought in there. They're all set up in the proper order and uh, they offer a sacrifice and, the, and fire comes down there and takes care of the sacrifice and the, the glory of God's presence is over the tabernacle. And he says, that's the place, but I'm going to tell you later on where to put it. Well, they think, well, we'll put it down here for a month. I mean, there's 12 tribes. There's 12 months out of the year. We'll give each one of them, you know, this de democratic idea. God says, you'll put it where I tell you to put it, or I'll throw you out of the land. You know, I, I, I don't know how to say this strongly enough. Today, people think I can serve God any way I want. The Bible says over in the book of Hebrews 13, let us serve God acceptably. I believe it's 13. Acceptably with, with uh, reverence and godly fear. Reverence is putting God's designs and plans ahead of anything else that we think. The idea that we can, we can do things the way we want, uh, that, that is very democratic of you. That is very uh, uh, individualistic and uh, libertine of you but it is not God's way of doing these things. Under the place, God would point out one place for them where they would worship, 
offer their sacrifice, bring their offerings, a place where they would have fellowship. Anybody know what that's called today? Church, yeah. Well, I just, I just, you know, there's so, so many hypocrites in church. I just want to sit home and, and uh, I can, I can pray at home. I can watch TV at home. I can do this at home. I had a guy one time. I met him like that, and I said, uh, "Can I ask you a question?" Yeah, I said, uh, "You made it home, and you're the you're the pastor of uh, kind of the home pastor." And I just, yeah. yeah. How many missionaries your church send out? Oh, well, how many, how many revival meetings? How many, how many times do you get together uh, for, for public ministry? How many times do you get together to just sing praises to God where the world can know? How many times does, you, does your church gather together, the whole fourth of the word of life, to lost people? Uh, well, uh, well, we do that. We, we witness to people. You know, you can justify anything. And you'd still be wrong <laughs> if it's not what God said. Now, listen, I'd rather have somebody doing that than worshiping the devil. And I'd rather have somebody do that than be lost. But why does it have to be that or doing what's right? I mean, you think, well, I'm halfway there, or at least I know the Bible's true. What does it say? It says the church is the root and ground and pillar of truth. Paul wrote to Timothy uh, with instructions that he might know how to behave himself there. Why? Well, because you're going to bring a whole bunch of people together that you're going to have to be long-suffering toward. A bunch of people that you're going to have to look at and say, man, what a, what a dingbat that person is. But, man, praise God, they're saved. <laughs> I know, don't look at me when you say that. Everybody see what I'm getting at? You know what church teaches you? It teaches you something like a big family. Get along. It ain't all about you. It's about everybody collectively in a purpose, serving God, do, ministering uh, God's word to, to the lost people. When you make church, uh, talking to somebody the other day, when you make church your evangelistic outreach, anybody know what happens in church? Every sermon, every message, every song, every invitation is come receive Jesus as your savior. How many people in here been saved for five years or more? Anybody in here been saved more than 20? 30? How many messages you suppose you've heard that have to do with how you should live, how you ought to behave yourself, and things that have nothing to do with how do you, how are, how's a man born again? If you've been in a church that preaches the Bible, you've heard lots of them. But if you've been in a lot of churches... You don't know anything of the, about those things other than how to dress, how to be a soul winner, how to come to church, how to tithe, and how to worship the pastor. That may be under another color, but it's, that's kind of what it comes down to. Because you didn't learn the Bible. You learned a few fundamentals out of the Bible. God says, that church is supposed to tr be training the brethren so that's why I don't make every church a fishing expedition. I always give an invitation. I always I put something in there that if you're lost and you're here, man, you need to get saved because you're without God and without Christ. You're without hope in this world. But that can't be the whole message or you'll never learn anything about what is your Christian life supposed to entail. You'll think it's just good manners and being nice to people. That's not a bad thing to do, but that is not the Christian testimony. So anyway, we go back to this. In, uh, in the time in the wilderness, they had a tent to meet in. Where, where did they meet? Did anybody ever read about where the Jews met while they were in Egypt? I mean, what did they do? That's a pretty interesting question, isn't it? Because there is no answer. They didn't do anything. They remembered their genealogy. They remembered the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that brought them up to the, the kind of the tribal level when God brought them down in there. But God didn't give them any further things. They didn't observe the Sabbath. They didn't uh, offer uh, sacrifices on a regular basis as prescribed in the Bible. There were sacrifices there but uh, not in great detail. But when they come out, God says, now here's what we're going to learn. 
the closer you want to get to me, the more you're going to do what I want you to do. That's what we call fellowship. You're willing to accommodate the, the superior. When God says something, we bow and say, yes, Lord. No, no, no uh, shame in that. That'd be an honor in that, to honor a creator. So anyway, in the wilderness, they'd put up that tabernacle, but they had a tent of the congregation before that. When they wanted to talk to God, they'd go find Moses. And uh, if they could convince Moses, God, uh, Moses would talk to God. God give him something back. Moses would convey that information. In chapter 40 of Exodus, the tabernacle set up. Now they're going to talk to Moses. They're going to, God's going to deal with, uh, 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 with Aaron and his sons as a perpetual priesthood on down through the ages. During the millennium, that priesthood will still be going on. Say, so, well, who are they? Nobody knows today, but God does. And he'll figure it all out. So he'll put them all back in place. Okay, so they have the tent of meeting in the wilderness. And then they have the tabernacle that was built to uh, excruciatingly specific specifications. God even uh, specially gifted uh, Basileel and some men in how he wanted things done. Uh, they're, they're making them according to their pattern. But God gave them the pattern to make them to. God gave Moses the directions for the tabernacle and then infused the rest of the information to these people so they could conduct and carry out these things as a place to meet God. God says, this is the place where you can meet me. When Solomon comes along over in 1 Kings chapter 8, God had given David the plans for these things. God revealed, when, when David dies, all the, plan, all the blueprints for the temple are there. But God says, you're a man of war. You're not going to build it. Your son will build it. Your son will be a man of peace. I say, well, yeah, but Solomon was, Solomon was something else. But you know what he was? He was David's son. He was a man of peace. And he was the man God chose to do that. Today, everybody, well, you know, he's not perfect. <laughs> you know something? There's only been one perfect man as long as this world turns There'll always have been only one perfect man. He's the Savior. Everybody else is either the redeemed or, or the uh, fuel for the fire that uh, goes into that thing. So at any rate, the Temple of Solomon gets built. Uh, that later on is destroyed. They build uh, 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 the Temple in uh, the latter days and uh, Malachi and Haggai and, and so forth. And the, the old men, they come in there and look at it, and the old men wept. And you say, what they weep about? Well, I've won. They were probably glad there was a temple back there again. But they're looking at what would have been torn down previous to that. And they're looking at this thing that they threw up out of there. And this man, it ain't nothing that it used to be. And God says, it's enough. I'll meet you there. You did what you could do. Watch what I'll do with you now. And then later on, Herod's temple comes along and there's 40 years of building that. You know what they do in that? Turn their back on their Messiah. They wanted to go meet God there, but when God showed up, they didn't want him. That's pretty bizarre, isn't it? So he comes suddenly to his own temple. He did. He came in there. What did he find? It was a den of thieves. Turned the tables over, chased them out, did it again later on. You'd think after the, the first time they'd learn, maybe we ought to kind of clean up our act here. You know what they thought? Whatever it is, just passing. We're in charge. We can do it. That's, that's the way a lot of people think today. Listen, when God disrupts your life for something, I don't know that you're living some wicked, sinful life. And I wouldn't accuse anybody of that. But it would be a real good time to kind of check yourself out, wouldn't it? Say, Lord, search me. See if there's any wicked way in me. I want you to do good. John 24, uh, John 4:24, uh, Jesus uh, stops by the well that uh, Jacob gave to uh, Joseph. That's interesting. I never found that in the Old Testament. <laughs> Apparently there it is. Maybe it's the one that was uh, dry at one time and Joseph was in it. I don't have any idea. All I know is, is this. A woman starts a debate with Jesus about what they ought to do, what's right with God. And you know something is, 
people are not, not afraid at all to tell Jesus what their religion is all about and how they're supposed to do it. And, what the, and, and you know, Jesus has his. She says, well, well, you Jews say something else, but we say it's up in this mountain, blah, blah, blah. And Jesus simply said, uh, the hour's coming, the day is, when they that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. Anybody think that a Protestant church worships God in spirit and in truth? They might do it in the honesty of their heart, but that's a far cry from the spirit of God and it's a way distant second from truth. Catholic Church may have a very elaborate ceremony and the Mormon temple might put on a show that would dazzle the devil himself. But it is a million miles from spirit of God and truth. And yet the basis of Christians can bow their head and praise the living God for his salvation, for God's ability, God's kindness to him. And God could accept that as real worship. It's not a matter of having the Mormon tabernacle choir sing great uh, swelling uh, songs. It's a matter of what's in your heart. It's what God's looking for. It's where he wants to dwell, isn't it? Didn't he say, I'm going to give you a place where I'll meet with you? <laughs> Can't get closer than that. There it is right there. In the millennial temple, there'll be yet another temple built. By the way, when Jesus was asked for proof of who he was, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And then they even throw that back in his face later on. And you know what they you realize? They knew when he said it what he meant. This deceiver said, destroy him in three days. He'd raise himself up. They weren't confused. They knew exactly what he was saying. The holiness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ isn't dwelling with you, you're not near them. You're not with him. All right. In Isaiah chapter 2, it draws a picture of all of the nations coming to Jerusalem to find out who is this great king. In Hebrews chapter 8, it draws a picture of everybody in the world knowing who Jesus is, from the least to the greatest. Boy, you, you couldn't imagine that's today. That's a day when something has happened that changes the entire nature and course of the world. That's the day when Jesus Christ shows up to claim the kingdom the Father has prepared for him. Look, uh, let, let's read on down through here. Uh, verse 8, uh, verse 7. This, this is, has to do with worship, and it's a celebratory aspect of worship. Sometimes we get this, The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent. Uh, you know, yeah, that might pass as real holy or pious to some people. Uh, but to God, he looks at us, you fraud, you phony. <laughs> you don't think like that. You don't talk like that. The charismatics carry it to the other kind of extreme. Ah, blah! <laughs> you know what God wants you to do? He wants you to worship him with all of your soul, all of your spirit, all of your mind, and all of your strength. Just say, praise God, I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you for washing my sins away. Thank you, God, for being so good to me. I thank you, Lord, that that love was in there enough that I could get in. In verse 8, it says, You shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. They were sort of on a, uh, oh, what do you think about it? You know, what's your opinion of it? For a year, uh, not uh, as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. I think we're going to stop here because when we get to this rest business, it's some pretty interesting stuff and it, uh, it's conveyed over to sort of the illustrations and the answers and all of that stuff over into the book of Hebrews about, well, how do you rest? The Bible says there, there yet remaineth a rest for the people of God. What is that rest? I hope you understand it now. We'll deal with it uh, at uh, maybe a little bit greater length next week. 
before we, uh, before we go, as God reveals His will to men, the option of doing it your way becomes exceedingly dangerous. You know, people today are sold on this. Well, but what I think, and I, you know, I wasn't raised that way, and, and I'm from so-and-so, and this is the way we do it there. Those are all true. I mean, they're all obviously the way men relate and deal with things. But it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that God has spoken about what he wants, how he would have us respond, come to him. Well, well our church does it this way. Wow. <laughs> you, better, you better find out if your church does it God's way or just their own way because those days are gone. Proverbs 16, 25 says, There's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Well, I tell you what, if that has ever been true, it is true today in spades. Everybody that you meet has their own way of looking at everything, and God help you if you try and define the words of the Bible from the Bible. They redefine everything according to whatever their favorite dictionary, encyclopedia, preacher, Sunday school teacher, friends, devil, whatever comes into their mind or in their ears, they'll reinvent it so that it satisfy what they mean. You, you look at uh, Briderism, Calvinism, Protestantism. A Jew is no longer a Jew. The church is no longer the church. Born again doesn't mean much anymore. And yet God hasn't changed a one of those definitions. He hasn't changed a one of those uh, designations in his entire history. And he's not going to. Let's stand. I think with a, with a message like that, we ought to sing, Have thine own way, Lord. 